Hi, everybody. Um, thank you for being here. Yeah, it's 3 p.m. on Friday, so we really appreciate the fact that you're here today. Um, my name is Miguel. This is Daniel. We are the co-founders at Chainloop. Chainloop is an open source project that allows you to collect, secure, and distribute software supply chain metadata. But before that, we used to work at Binami and VMware, where we did a lot of CI CD automation. And some of that automation is what's behind today, for example, the, the Binami container images or Helm charts that you might be using today. But today, we are here to talk about something else. Today, we're going to be talking about what does it mean uh, trustworthy software building materials? Why you should care about it now? Then we're going to be looking at different solutions that can help us to, get, to reach that goal. Then we're going to have a demo and finally some closing thoughts about what could come next. So we're going to start with this traditional CICD pipeline all the way from source code to production. So you might be building a, a, a Go binary at build time, then you're packaging it in a container image, and then pushing it to an OCR registry and finally deploying it to, to a Kubernetes cluster. But the interesting bit and the reason we put this diagram here is because eventually, and this might have happened to you already, you will get other stakeholders in your organization that want to, they will have a saying on how you are releasing software. So for example, you might have a security team asking for a mechanism to uh, manage vulnerabilities. Or you might have a compliance team that want to double check, or they want to make sure that some open source licenses for some third parties don't go through. And of course, you might have an SRA team or a platform team that wants to make sure that the system is healthy, so on and so forth. And this gets more complex the, the, the bigger the organization is, and we're going to see that later. But in our experience, these, uh, many of these use cases start with software supply chain metadata. And by software supply chain metadata, we mean any piece of information, any context that you can get about what you're building and how you're doing it. So this can go from CVS scans, VEX files, some legal security architecture reviews, QA tests, and of course, software bill of materials. So software bill of materials is a canonical example. And for, for those who hasn't heard of it, it's just a standardized machine readable list of packages, licenses, and so on. So you might have been asked, and this again, this can, might sound very familiar, to, to start taking care of adding, generating those software bill of materials and some parts of your pipeline, or running some CV scans and create some control gates. For example, you might, you might have chosen to use SIF to generate a Cyclone DX SBOM when you're building, a, when you're building the, the binary. And then you might be taking a SBOM and sending it to an artifact registry and publishing it to an OCR registry, or you might be sending it to dependency tracks to work, so on and so forth. And this is a good starting point. This is a good starting point, but today, what we want to be um, talking about is, we want to be challenging, is this vision on this line. This line that you know, we call SBOM trust, or below material trust, all the way from the generation to the distribution or analysis. And we know that SBOM trust is a very overloaded term. So that's why the easiest way, uh, at least for me, to to come up with what we're looking for is just to ask questions. So these are the kind of questions I will ask about my software bill of material gathering, generation, and distribution. So for example, can I uniquely identify the software bill of material that I'm, I'm looking for? If I know I'm looking for a specific SBOM, can I find it? Can I, is it gonna be available when I need it? If I need it for some auditing purposes or for some analysis, is it gonna be there or was just recycled by some archival process in GitHub. Can I trust that the content hasn't been tampered? If I'm generating at the build time, can I trust that when I use it on the other end, it hasn't changed? And can I answer any question of how it was built? By whom? And the, the last two things, they look like very simple things, but actually they're very hard to do. Is, is the S1 complete or consistent with the rest of, of pieces of evidence that we're creating? And of course, does it even exist? And the answer to these questions might be no, in some of them, it's in our case. But now, 
the second question will be, but why should I care? I, I, have my, I have my pipeline here, I have my checkboxes, I got my bonus, I'm doing S bonus, this is great, but why should I care about all this, all this additional uh, complexity? And the answer is, well, I have two answers, the, the, the real answer and the answer that you might, your company might care about, but in general, software supply chain attacks are on the rise, and this is causing um, to, some regulations to, to pop up, starting with uh, the US, but the Cyber Resilient Act in Europe coming, coming next. So this might prevent you from selling software in the future if, you're not, if you don't start taking this uh, seriously. So from that point of view, uh, so bear, bear with me, I know that this is overly dramatic, but um, a software bill of material that you can trust is useless, and in fact, it should be considered dangerous because you're making, or you will be making critical decisions out, out of it. So when it's over bill of materials that are uniquely identifiable, enforceable, complete, and available. I'm gonna explain what are those, those properties next. So we came up with this diagram. This diagram is just a, a set of properties that your system, a system that, the end to, that goes from the end to end from the generation of the S-bomb all the way to the distribution should have. So things like making sure that you can enforce the, the, the collection of the sword bill of material, making sure that you can sign it and you can verify its integrity, making sure that it can, it's immutable, it cannot be overridden, so things like that. And we're gonna be going through each one of those and we're gonna be looking at solutions for, for those properties. And the first one is gonna be provenance and verification. And for provenance and verification, basically knowing how uh, this one has been generated and making sure it hasn't been tampered with, for us, is, uh, it's easier to start thinking about S-bombs from the lens of yet another artifact in your software supply chain. It's just another, another element that you're producing, and you need to make sure if, you are, if you're, uh, you're working on the security posture of, of your company, making sure that you can elevate the security posture of that, that metadata as well to the highest security posture that you can offer, because they can get compromised too. And the good news are that actually there is a framework that describes different levels of assurance, different uh, attack vectors, which is the SALSA framework. And this can be applied here too. And there are two concepts that uh, to me are very important and we should apply here, which are integrity and, and provenance. So how can we achieve that? How can we uh, achieve integrity and provenance? And the underlying component of all of it is what they call software attestation. And an attestation is just yet another JSON file that contains arbitrary information about your software, what you're building. So for example, if you're building a container image, you might, you might store how, how you build it or what's inside of it, what build system uh, configuration you had. And that will give you the, the provenance information but then the second part, the second component of an attestation, it, it is authenticated, which means that it is signed, and which means that you can then verify integrity out of it. So as you can imagine, there should be a way that we could take our sort of bill of materials and somehow wrap it in a, an attestation and enable integrity and provenance verification with it. And we have tools out there. We have the Intoto framework, which is this attestation framework. Um, we have six store that you can use six store you can use any other any other provider we have witness and also there is this um, this effort called vomit that is actually trying to solve the how the how, the, how you're building how you're creating um, SBOMs that you can trust so with that we could say that we can cover more or less the, the provenance and verification so we have um, wrapped uh, SBOMs at this point but now the next question is where do we store it and how do we store it? So we can also meet the uniqueness and integrity part of it. And for that, you could say you can store it in a database, you can send it by email, things like that, but there is a much older concept, you know, the content address for storage, that at the end of the day is just a place where you retrieve data by their digest of their content. And not by its name, not by its, any of the metadata, but just by, by, the, by their content. 
And that simple change uh, enables integrity and immutability out of the box. And the good news for that is there is a container for storage solution that we use every day, which is an OCI registry. So we can use OCI to store SBOMs, and that will give us the unique, uh, unique and identifiable uh, properties of it. So if we go back to our pipeline, we could technically take another station, wrap, it, uh, wrap the SBOM in it, and then store that sign at the station in an OCI registry. So we will get SBOMs that you can trust in identity, integrity, and origin. So that's, that's pretty good. But now you might be thinking, this is hard to scale. And because what I show this one pipeline, and usually the, the responsibility is delegated to the development team, so how do you scale this for your organization without um, having the problem of having all the metadata scattered across silos because they may be choosing different artifact registries or it may be inconsistent because they may be using different tools instead of using SIFT, they may be using something else or different formats. And of course, you cannot, it's, it's hard to enforce um, the generation of that metadata. So let's say that you could disable Trivi at some point and that release will go through. So how can you, be, how can you enforce that? And that's one problem, but the second problem is, if you remember this, this picture of different stakeholders asking for information, it gets much worse than that. In a bigger organization, you might end up having the security team starting to ask you about integrity with salsa we mentioned before, or they might be asking about um, ways of sharing SMOMs. You might be in the process of doing SOC2, which is a lot of fun. You might need to figure out how to retrieve pieces of evidence of that. And of course, the platform team might be asking for SLO, some more advanced things. So you can tell this gets quite complex and it's very hard to scale. And that's the reason we build Chainloop. Chainloop, as I mentioned, is a mechanism to collect metadata, like store below materials, and then secure it, wrapping into the stations, and send it to different locations. It can be OCI registries, dependency track, WAC, and so on and so forth. But the important part, and uh, the important part of the chain loop is that we made sure that we define um, the, the separation of concerns between developers and security and, and other stakeholders in your organization. So the people on the right can decide what metadata they want to receive, they can decide where to put it, and they can decide what to do with it while the developers will just need to provide the metadata to stay compliant with, with those requirements. So a little bit more on that. This is an example of how you could, with Chainloop, enforce the fact that you want to make sure that a run runs in GitHub and is sending a cycle on the X JSON format. Once you do that, that requirement will get propagated to developers and they will, they will need to provide it and that will get verified before sending it. So that will give us the enforcement part. And the second part is when we talk about availability. And is the fact that Chainloop can give you, a, we call it federated content addressable storage, but it takes content addressable concept and move it one step further across different backends. So you can have advanced routing and replication requirements. So you might need to have some specific piece of metadata for two years in Azure Blob storage because of some compliance reasons. You could do it with, with Chainloop, for example. So if you put together this diagram, you will see that we have the same, the same open source components, which are awesome, like Sigstore, in Toto, in Toto, Salsa, so on and so forth. But we extend, Chainloop extends on, on the enforcement part, side of things and also on the, on the distribution part with, uh, with the federated storage. So next, Daniel's gonna do a demo. Hi, everyone. Okay. Can you hear me? Perfect. So now the tough part. Let's talk about our use case first. Um, we are part of the organization building and delivering software. Um, we have many teams, many different microservices. Uh, we use different tools, but in that very specific scenario, we use GitHub uh, on developer side. On SecOps compliance side, we use dependency track for CV scanning and open source license <laughs> compliance. We use GUAC. And we have also Azure Blob storage, compliance storage across organization and one OCA registry. What do we want to do? 
We want to start collecting all artifacts built by developers together with software bill of materials. We want to store it in the trusted way. We want to wrap it in, in total attestation. We want to push it to Azure Blob Storage in the OCI registry. And we also want to send it to all these different DevSecOps tools that we have, like Dependency Track or Guac and others. So we'll use Chainloop. We'll deploy Chainloop on the right side and we'll have an API, the contract defined between SecOps and developers. We'll ask them to run all these different workflows in GitHub and start providing binaries, the jar files, together with SBOM files. So as I said, let's take a look at the right side. We will use Chainloop open source projects. Uh, Chainloop has a few components, the control plane, the API service, we have CLI as well, and that CLI can be used on the operator side or on the CI side, the, the, the developer side. So in my terminal, I have Chainloop CLI, the latest version installed. This is actually live, so we'll show you. I have a few CAS backends uh, already connected. I have AWS S3, Azure Blob. I have our inline storage OCI registry. Let's take a look at integrations that we have connected. Uh, as I said, we have few instances of dependency track, GUAC, we have also Slack, you, you can add more, you can build your own integrations uh, as well. And the last thing, Miguel was already showing it, we have a workflow created on the, uh, on the chain loop side, and we have a contract connected. This is a declarative version contract, so you can keep adding or removing things here, and they're going to be propagated uh, to all organizations and developer uh, teams. So let's jump to other sites. We are on developer side. Um, now we have to start sending uh, artifacts and S-bombs. So if you use GitHub, you can use our reusable workflow. As you can see here, you need just two files or two changes. One, we need .chainloop.yaml file and specify where can I find those metadata or artifacts. And below, you have just a job to, to, to use that reusable workflow. And you need the token, we call it, we call it uh, Chainloop Robot Account token, to be able to push uh, metadata and artifacts to, uh, to Chainloop. Of course, you don't have to use GitHub. You also can use, as I said, Chainloop CLI. So we have, we call it attestation guided process, and we follow some principles from Git. Uh, so you can initialize attestation, you can add different artifacts and metadata, you can push things to uh, to chain loop. We recently also added support for remote state. It means that you can actually run all these different commands in different jobs and state is kept uh, on the chain loop uh, service. So now let me go to developer. So I have that project, this is the Java uh, Demo Spring Pet Clinic project. I already showed you that we added that uh, change that file to specify where you can find my binar binary. By the way, you can take a look at GitHub. It's, uh, it's one of our projects in Chainloop Dev. And now, what's going to happen, uh, a new job is created. It's called Chainloop Attestation. And as part of this attestation, yeah, great job. You have met all compliance and security requirements you can see that all the metadata has been recorded, everything what uh, security and compliance team ask you for, the artifact, SBOM, and different other environment variables, uh, git commit, uh, hash, et cetera, et cetera. You can add more. If you click that chain loop trust report, you can actually go to the chain loop reports where you can find all this information I talked about, the contract, the in-total uh, uh, statements, 
uh, with all information like, you know, Miguel made a last commit here. You have all information about uh, our GitHub repository, uh, artifacts, uh, and some other um, ident identifiers for, from Chainloop. So that was the developer side. If we get back to SecOps, now I would like to show you that magically, chain loop through integration pulls all these different metadata artifacts to, to, to other systems and other services. So you can see here the dependency track. Uh, I have my demo spring pet clinic. Uh, developers, they don't even have to know about these services. They don't have to have uh, credentials to dependency track or, or, or Azure blob storage. The only thing what they have to do, they have to just focus on their uh, on their artifacts and push metadata to, to chain loop. So I can just show you that it's real. I can search for the most important library in Java world, log4j, or you can see here uh, different metadata automatically pushed uh, to, uh, to our Azure blob storage. I can also take a look at, the, uh, at our CLI. So I can list all workflows for that very specific workflow runs for this specific workflow. I can also retrieve attestations. So you can automate things uh, on your site. Uh, this attestation is verified with the public key I have uh, on my computer here. Uh, I can get more user-friendly output where you can see that, yeah, everything has been verified. The same output you have seen in GitHub. Now, uh, I want to show one more thing. Because Chainloop is the open source metadata vault for software supply chain. So as you can see here, uh, we are storing information about spring pet cleaning jar file, and we are creating some kind of graph in our federated storage. We have information about S-bombs, but at the same time, our security team, our legal team, our compliance team, they can start producing different metadata with regards to that very specific uh, jar file as well. So uh, I have already pushed some uh, metadata like VEX files to chain loop, and I will try to download them. So what are we are going to do? I'm going to first check the, the digest of uh, the jar file I have here. And now with the digest, I want to query Chainloop. So I will ask Chainloop, tell me everything what you know about that very specific version of the Sp Spring Pet Clinic. And now you, you will get you know, machine readable list of different attestations produced by different teams, parties, automations. And you can do cool things about that. So as I, I can see here, for instance, the one attestation created by security team, it's called VEX registry. So we are storing all VEX files related to different uh, uh, artifacts. Uh, and this is the attestation actually created by the GitHub, by the development team, and more security uh, attestations. I can download metadata, and I don't have to have credentials to S3 Azure Blob Storage. Let's see how the network works. So I just downloaded SBOM for the JART file. But I also can read more about one of the VEX attestations. And I can see that there are two artifacts there, open VEX and also artifact. And I can even try to download that VEX file and then use it when, do, when the CV scanning with Trivi, for instance. This way I can remove false positives uh, or other CVs that are already reviewed by our security team. So, um, 
if you want to get one thing about this talk, it's about um, we believe that metadata compliance and security, um, the bar is going to be, uh, it's been raised, as we speak. And so we're building material trust on metadata in general. Trust is the next challenge. And the reason we believe it's important is because it's the foundation for, for the rest of the use cases that we have been talking about. We have been talking about control gates, for example. You can use a discovery endpoint to, to find information. You can maybe using, you may want to start sharing S1, not by email, but actually through another mechanism. So for that, we believe that um, trust, uh, metadata trust, for so material trust is, is going to be a requirement for, for the future. But the good news um, is that we have a, you know, the future is bright uh, with open source. We have a very healthy uh, set of tools right now that we can put together. And, and of course, you can use Chainloop and you can find it in, a, in that repository. So thank you very much for, for your time. Um, if you have any questions, thank you. Hi, thank you for your talk. Uh, discover, I'm discovering chain loop uh, thanks to your talk. Uh, I have a question. Did I, uh, did I understand this correctly? With chain loop, I can actually have my v VEX updated uh, over, the, over time. Does that mean that? Uh, yeah. Uh, yes, uh, I mean, chain loop can be a way for you to share VEX files. But it's you to, to, to create those VEX files and then push them to, to Chainloop. Uh, so this, this demo was just showing you a way to, 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 to collect and then discover VEX files. OK, thank you. So it, it will not uh, allow will not me to update with the latest uh, vulnerability disclosure. Uh, I, will do, I, I need to do that. You have to do it on your own, and then you have to push it to, to Chainloop. Yes. OK, thank you. But Chainloop seems great. Hi, thanks for the talk. Um, one quick question. Are you performing on Chainloop side any validations? If, for example, the S-bombs that are pushed are proper S-bombs, the artifacts are real artifacts, do we do some kind of validations there? Um, we do some validation in the client. Um, so when the operator defines a, that it needs an S-bomb, it will say the format of the S-bomb. I mean, to start with, meaning Cyclone DX or, or SPDX. And that means that when the, the developer provides the test one, we'll make sure that it's, you know, Cyclone DX 1.5, things like that. What's coming, though, is actually making sure that you can add policies to, to that. So the operator can decide, basically, run a regular policy against the content of the s to make sure that you know, it was generated by the, the version of SIFT that you really care about, or you want to make sure that it has all the dependencies. So that's coming. So long story short, we have validations in the client. Right now, they're more basic, they're basic, but now you're going to be able to customize it with custom validations as well before nice. they get pushed. Thanks. Can you talk about, about uh, sequence evaluations as well? Go ahead. Yeah, uh, there's one more thing. Uh, today, integrations are asynchronous, right? But what we are thinking about in the future, at the moment that you are sending, for instance, Cyclone DX S bomb to Chainloop, will do synchronous call through integration to some, I don't know, service to validate uh, that S-bomb or to scan for CVEs. And if something is wrong, you will be able to immediately report back to developers and break the, the PR or just, uh, just to ask for, 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 for some changes. 